All right. All right. Well, good evening. And thank you so much to everyone for attending our Iowa History Book Club. We're so glad that you're here uh, virtually, of course. My name is Andrew Klump, and I am the editor of the Annals of Iowa here at the State Historical Society of Iowa. Every quarter, the State Historical Society hosts a book club during which we hear from authors and historians and discuss all periods and areas of Iowa history. You can learn more about this series and all of our programs at our website, which is iowaculture.gov. Uh, but remember, you have to sign up for every book club or event that you want to attend. Mostly, we're glad you're here tonight, and I hope you'll join us again in the future. Uh, today, we're continuing our, our 2023 Iowa History Book Club with Saved by Schindler, The Life of Selena Karp Vinyaz by William Fredericks, or Bill Fredericks, as I'll call him tonight. Uh, uh, but a few, first, a few housekeeping things before I introduce our speaker. Uh, one, closed captioning is available. You can activate through the action that through the action bar at the bottom of your screen. So you can go ahead and click that if you need that, uh, or if you just like it. Uh, you can look forward, we all look forward to Q&A at the end with Bill. Um, feel free to type your questions into the Q&A feature throughout the evening. So there's a Q&A feature at the bottom. Anytime tonight, feel free to drop your question in. My colleague Jennifer Cooley and I will receive those um, and then we'll be able to ask those to our speaker later. So if you know you have a question right now, go ahead and put it in. If as we're talking, you think of one, put it in, we will see it and we'll get, do our best to get to all the questions though if there's a lot we may not have time, but we'll do our very best. And then finally, by participating in this book club, you agree to engage respectfully with the presenter and the hosts and all of the participants. So any sort of harassing or disruptive behavior, including in the chat, is, is prohibited. We, can, we reserve the right to delete any comments that violate those guidelines. Um, and so with that, I am really excited to introduce our guest tonight, my friend, Bill Fredericks. Bill is professor of history emeritus at Simpson College in Indianola. Since moving to Iowa, Bill has served on numerous boards that have been dedicated to Iowa history and on commissions, including um, serving on our, uh, for a time on our State Historical Society of Iowa Board of Trustees and as the director of the Iowa History Center at Simpson. Um, in addition to a number of other wonderful projects. He's the author of numerous books in Iowa history. And I, as I was looking at your books, Bill, I noticed that you focused a lot on major institutions and individuals in the state. Um, so things like the Des Moines Register, FM Hubble, Roxanne Conlin. And so as all of you know, his newest book, Saved by, Schindler's conti conti Saved by Schindler, uh, has continued to build on his interest in the people and institutions that have shaped our state in the 20th century. And so I thought that was a really, I, a nice thread to your work is the people and institutions, especially 20th century ones. So I'm really glad tonight to welcome my friend Bill Fredericks here tonight to be a part of our conversation. Thanks for being here, Bill. Well, thank you, Andrew. It's a pleasure. Yeah, wonderful. Well, we're here to talk about the book tonight. And so I wanted to just get started with something a little bit broader, which is I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what sparked your interest in this topic and how you actually decided to pursue writing this, this book, Saved by Schindler. Um, I heard Selena speak at Valley High School. I imagine many people uh, here tonight did in 2017, but I had no inkling that I might work on her biography. Um, two years later, Sandy Yoder, the head of the Iowa Jewish Historical Society, um, asked if I were interested in writing the book. So. This book came to me. Well, we talked a while. I had some other books I was finishing, but uh, she was convincing. And uh, I, I was really thrilled to do it because she was such an enthralling speaker. So I was really excited to do it. And I started the book in uh, October, November of 2019. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, great. And so um, I, I'm just curious as a follow up to that. Have you done a lot of work or thinking around the, like the Holocaust or, or the experience of Jewish Iowans, or was that a new kind of L layer of, of your own work? Um, it, in graduate school, I had a, a field in international relations and a field in US foreign policy. So I knew of the Holocaust that way, but um, no, this was a new topic for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I started the book, I obviously did a lot of background reading. So I checked out 20 or 25 books, uh, on the Holocaust and Polish history and uh, Oscar Schindler and World War II. And mm -hmm. that was how I got started. It's a classic historian move, right? To <laughs> enter a new topic and check out 25 books and, 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 and find your, try to read your way through it. That's right, exactly, exactly. Yes. 
Great. Well, I wonder, you know, was there any part of the research and writing process <clears throat> for this book that surprised you? Um, and if there was, you know, could you tell us a little bit about that? Um, sure. I guess the, the biggest surprise was COVID, as you can imagine. So um, COVID really threw a curveball into things. I started the book in late 2019 and uh, COVID hit in March. So the first problem was I had to cancel my trip to go visit Selena in uh, Southern California. So all my interviews with her and with everybody else I interviewed were by Zoom or by phone, which isn't nearly as good as doing you know, interviews in person, um, but it, it worked. Um, a plus to all this, I guess, all those library books I told you I had, I got to keep because libraries <laughs> were all closed. So I had those books for months and months, which was yeah. great. Um, yeah. Another downside was the archives were closed. So primary documents I needed were very slow in, uh, in getting to me. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, so COVID was a real curveball. One of the surprises in my research, I was able to um, uncover the identity of, of Selena's uncle. Um, this was a man who was married to her aunt, um, her mother's sister. And Selena remembered him as a dental technician. Um, she couldn't remember his name, and she said he, he was not on Schindler's List. He did not work in the same factory she or her parents did. <clears throat> but it turns out um, he was on Schindler's List, oh. um, and his name was Adolf Oberfeld. Um, Selena's aunt ended up being killed before the war was over, but he stuck with the family for a few months afterward, went back to Krakow with them, and then he eventually broke off with them and went to uh, Israel, where he mm -hmm. died in... Uh, 1950. So Selena was really interested in finding uh, finding out about that uncle. I imagine that and I, 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 there's a question I'd, I'd like to ask too. You know that that I imagine that's one of the more rewarding parts of doing a biography of someone who is still living. Um, and so I, I wonder, you know, that that was kind of leads nicely to one of my other questions, which was, what was it like to to be writing the biography of someone? who's still alive, um, were there any particular challenges um, or advantages? And it sounds like there, I, I imagine what some of these answers are, but I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about that work as a historian. Sure. We, we, you know, like this isn't a biography of Grant, right? Written by, you know, McCull you know Monk McCullough, Grant's been long dead. Right. This is a reading <laughs> right. person who can offer you feedback and- Right. Uh, um, a, a key advantage obviously is being able to ask the questions you have. Yeah. Um, and then ask follow-up questions. So even though I was visiting with Selena by uh, phone or by Zoom, we developed a really good rapport and uh, she was very forthcoming. So it was a, was a great relationship we built over the uh, few years I worked on the book. Uh, the downside is, and you might imagine this, um, people's memories sometimes uh, don't match up with the reality of the past. Um, and one example of that, if you're interested, um, when Selena and the rest of the Schindler women were being shipped in cattle cars uh, from Plashoff to Schindler's factory in uh, Brunlitz, Czechoslovakia, um, the train stopped and all the women were excited. They expected to be at Brunlitz, but they were at Auschwitz. And Selena always tells that story and she said it was a terrible mistake. And Schindler worked behind the scenes to get us out of Auschwitz and eventually we did. I think they were there about three weeks. But the reality was it was a planned stop. The Germans um, wanted to quarantine workers between work camps to keep disease from spreading. So uh, Selena didn't know that, the women didn't know that. But so Selena's memory is, it was a big mistake and it turns out it was just Nazi plans uh, mm -hmm. operating correctly. So that's an issue. You, you have the real advantage of knowing the person and talking to the person frequently, but the disadvantage is sometimes you come up against memories which aren't quite right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, that's always been my fear, you know, like of working with people doing recent history. And I am a 19th century historian, so I do not often encounter uh, anyone who is alive for the areas that I study. But I, I, I can see that both the incredible advantage of that, but also some of the challenges that come right. along squaring the past with our memories of it. Um, sure. Yeah, that, that's terrific. Um, I'm curious, you know, the Holocaust is a really difficult topic to study. Uh, it's emotionally taxing to engage um, with those histories. I, I wonder, you know, as since we're kind of talking about your approach and then the challenges, how did you go about 
uh, you know, studying such a difficult or painful topic. And I ask partially because I recently worked on a project on the farm crisis. And I remember how drained I was when I would go through those archives and see, you know, just the farm, you know, the farm crisis was not the, a genocide. It was, it was a different kind of suffering, right. but it, right. even that was emotionally taxing. And I wonder if you could talk about, you know, that as a person trying to write these histories um, that are so hard. Yeah, I, um, I thought I knew what I was getting into, and I, I really didn't. Um, it, it's different reading about this from a secondary source than actually talking to somebody who, who encountered these things and who had the incredible bravery to stand up to Joseph Mengele, for instance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but um, I, I don't know. I, I, uh, sometimes I would step away from the work for a day or two. Um, sometimes I would move to a different portion of the research, um, get away from the, the Holocaust. Um, but I, I think what really pushed me, I, I thought Selena's story was incredibly important. Um, I think all Holocaust stories are incredibly important now, especially given the rising tide of anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I just kept my head down and kept working through it was what I, what I ultimately did. And it, you've read the book, you certainly know, Selena's story is ultimately uplifting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I had that to look forward to. Yeah, yeah, it's a, uh, it, it's a different, you're, you're not doing, you're not telling this, it's a different kind of story, even if it does go through those, but it's still challenging, you know, like it's- it, Well, it, it is, and, and that's the other reason. I really thought that uh, I needed to write an entire biography. Mm -hmm. Many books on the Holocaust memoirs only focus on that portion of the person's life. And mm -hmm. I was really interested in Selena as a child before the Holocaust and the very, um, amazing life she built afterward so mm -hmm. and I think it's that's another element of what you're doing with this book that helps to not only tell us a story about Schindler you know obviously Schindler is an interesting draw and a connection <clears throat> but, but to tell a broader narrative of a person's life of what happened afterwards and uh, even I think I was recently at a museum uh, in Indianapolis where they were having a, a survivor of Japanese internment speak so slightly so it's different but they wanted they wanted her to focus only on her internment experience but what wasn't they weren't telling the rest of the story right and it's right. interesting you've chosen you know to situate this horror amid a broader yeah. life you know and I think that's that's really interesting and, and a great contribution so mm, thank you um so this is Iowa History Book Club right I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how I, Iowa features in this story um, and what it meant to Biniaz. Um, Selena's uncle, uh, David Karp, a brother of her father, lived here in uh, Des Moines. He had come to Iowa in 1913 from Poland um, in a program called the Galveston Plan, which brought uh, Jewish immigrants through Galveston, Texas, as opposed to New York, because New York was being, there was growing discrimination against Jews in New York by the first couple of decades of the 20th century. So he made his way to Iowa, um, built up a very successful business. And it was David Karp who brought uh, his brother and Selena and Selena's mother to Iowa in 1947. Mm -hmm. Selena doesn't stay here very long, but she gets a really good education here. So for Selena, it's uh, a good education at North High School. She's a, a senior at North High. Um, and then she gets a full ride scholarship to Grinnell. Um, she speaks highly and fondly of both those institutions. Um, and she says courses at each place at uh, North High School, her civics class, and a couple of political science classes at Cornell really taught her what uh, it meant to be an American citizen. And mm -hmm. she really values that. Um, after that, she left Iowa um, only to return to visit her parents, but her parents stayed. So her parents were residents here for 50 years. They died in the 1990s and they had a, uh, a really, good life here in Iowa, and they enjoyed a, uh, a thriving Jewish community here in Des Moines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I, one of the things that I think about a lot as someone who works as a, editing a journal and telling Iowa stories is how much does someone, how much time does someone have to be here for it to be an Iowa story? How much, <laughs> you know, what, right. and, and the answer is, well, I, I answer that question in a complicated way, you know, uh, that, that isn't, there are people I know who say you have to be born here. There are some people who say you have to live here a certain amount of time. And it's interesting for you to talk about the short amount of time she had here, but also, but this mixture of her ties to this place and her formation in this place as a new American. Yeah, uh, yeah. 
And I should say she, um, she has very good connections with the Iowa Jewish Historical Society and mm -hmm. she still uh, really loves Iowa. So mm -hmm. what do you, you know, so if, if you are, if I'm a student of Iowa history, maybe I tuned in today because I'm interested in Iowa history and I, I read this book, you know, what would you say would be a big takeaway? You know, like what, what does her story, even in this brief period that she stops in and that her parents make a home here, I think they're certainly a part of this, right? They're their lives in Des Moines. You know, you know what, what does this tell us about, what does her story tell us about Iowa in this moment, or in that moment, I should say, uh, you know, or just in general? What, I'd love, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I, I you know, I, I, you know, I, I, um, I, I go back and forth. Is this an Iowa history? Is it not? Mm -hmm. um, because she has very important connections here through family and through her education, um, but almost all of her life is spent on Long Island or in the last. Uh, 20 years out in Southern California. Mm -hmm. um, is she an Iowan? I, I can't answer that. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the takeaway for Iowa history is there are an, a lot of really amazing stories tied to Iowa that people don't know or have forgotten. Mm -hmm. um, and there are other uh, Holocaust stories here. There are at least two survivors I can think of uh, who merit books and those have not been, uh, not been done. So mm -hmm. if people are interested, you should get going on these because <laughs> Um, that people are getting up there in age. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting, uh, you know, to hear you talk about, uh, you know, Selena's experience, but, and then we did not plan it this way necessarily, but our next book club uh, after the summer is about uh, Hoover, you know, uh, mm. Hoover's wife, um, and, you know, uh, who's Lou, Lou Henry Hoover. So there it right. is. Uh, uh, I, I knew the Lou was in there, but I didn't have the Henry. Lou Henry Hoover. <laughs> also grew up here, but then left for her adult life, but telling Iowa stories, you know, like uh, these are people who have rich connections and obviously me it means a lot that they're, they're connected to this place, even if that hasn't meant building a life here um, in adulthood. I think that's really an interesting take on an Iowa story um, and what it, what, what it is to claim them as a part of our stories. Yeah, well, and Iowa really launched Selena um, it was uh, her professor, Zick Brunel, that helped her get two very prominent scholarships. Mm -hmm. um, she had a full ride scholarship to Smith College in an MSW program. Uh, she started in that summer of uh, 52. And then um, she learned she won a Necky Fellowship, which was a very prestigious fellowship for displaced persons. Mm -hmm. And she ended up going to get a master's at Columbia Teachers College. Mm -hmm. And so, but that's Iowa that led to this break and then uh, moving to New York. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. And I think that, yeah, you, one of the things that convinces me that this is an Iowa story, of course, is your ability to articulate and, and position Iowa in this really transformational moment. She didn't kind of slide through in her 40s, stop a while at a, you know, work at working a job and then move on. You know, this was a period after a, a horrifying event that that set her up for a lifetime of yeah. of achievement and and work even and with connection to the state so right i you've made a good case for me but i am i i i'm probably a very sympathetic <laughs> audience I, you know, but if i put my cards on the table so yeah wonderful um one of the questions and i didn't send you this one uh, ahead of time but i was thinking about it this afternoon um it seems to me that you're writing about this topic and, and the title is Saved by Schindler, right? And so I'm thinking as a historian, you know, it, it's, it's a great uh, historian who's stud studying something that people in the public have an idea of from popular culture, right? So the movie Schindler's List, people have an idea of what who Schindler was and what happened over there. And that's great sometimes because that means people have an automatic connection or frame for understanding the work you want to do. But at the same time, there might be challenges of trying to argue, you know, complicate or tell a different story than maybe what was in the, the movie. And admittedly, it's been a while since I've seen the movie myself. But I'm wondering about that. You know, there are no surprise, surprise blockbuster movies about uh, rural Dutch folks, which is my own research, right? <laughs> I'm not, I do not have to struggle with this. There is no blockbuster about Sioux County, Iowa yet. Um, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, that must have loomed at some level, right? That popular culture, public awareness 
of this in your storytelling and in your historical research? Uh, sure, I, I guess I should, should uh, first come clean and say, I, I did not see the movie Schindler's List until I was started doing this research. So I did not see it when it came out for some reason. And um, I thought it was a great film when I, when I saw it as I was in the midst of this research. Um, and I, I thought it captured the, the essence of things. There are lots of factual errors or stretches of the truth. Um, I didn't come up with the title my publisher did, mm, um, yes. but, but, but I, I should say that, you know, in some ways, it, it, for those of you that have read it, in some ways it should be called Saved by Madrich, right? Because Madrich is the owner of this other factory, <clears throat> which kept the Schindlers alive and pretty well fed for prisoners um, for several years before Schindler is involved at all in the carp story. <clears throat> um, but, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> but when Bush came to shove and the uh, availability of Schindler's List was out there, it was Madrich and his manager that put the carps on that list. And that, that was a life saving for the carps. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, so, it's a, so it, it sounds like the, the popular cultural awareness of Schindler affected the title more than it affected your own work, you know, your own research and writing. Is that right? I think that's true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that's right. Terrific. Um, if people do, I'm just going to throw this out there because we've got a few more questions I have planned. But if you have questions, feel free to start putting those in the Q&A. We <laughs> have, we'll have plenty of time for those. But if you're thinking of things that you have questions, uh, go ahead and drop those in. We'll do our best to get to all of them. Um, and we are seeing a few come in. So if you're putting them in, we can see them um, and keep keep doing keep doing that. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about more about like some of the through lines maybe of Selena's life. And this is another question that I was thinking as I was preparing for today. But, but you know, as you think about her story and, and, and oftentimes you, we do biog as we do biography, we're also telling stories about the world during a particular time or, or making those kinds of claims about how society was developing. And what, what would you say were some of the themes or lessons that we learned <laughs> From, from hearing her story, from your choice to tell the whole story and not just focus on the horrors of the Holocaust? You know, for me, the, the most, one of the most interesting aspects of Selena's life is that she, she chose not to reveal this story about the Holocaust. Um, and I, I still don't know the answer. I've asked her, but she's never really given me a, a, a answer um that must have eaten up in her insides that she didn't feel she could share this <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> allergies <clears throat> um so, so that to me was a really essential part of her story um in high school she told a few people and the um high school had a radio station tied in with a local Des Moines radio station. And they dramatized this experience she had at Auschwitz with Joseph Mengele, when Mengele pointed her to the group of uh, people that would be killed and then gave her a second chance and she passed by and she said, let me go, and he did. So she told that story um, and it, it was dramatized on the radio, but after that, she, she very quickly realized that people just didn't understand or, or couldn't grasp what she went through. So she stopped talking about it. Her parents stopped talking about it. And Selena really um, didn't tell anyone. Her husband only knew the very broad outlines. Her children did not know until they were 10 or 12 years old. Um, she really kept this bottled up. And so that was really interesting to me. Um, she went on, she built this very successful life. She lived the American dream. She was the American dream. Um, she and her husband, two kids, upper middle class area on Long Island. Um, then she went into teaching. I've talked to some of her uh, students. They had no idea. They said she was such a happy person. She wore bright colors. Um, they had no idea of her experience and, and were stunned that, um, that she could have gone through such a dark period in her life and been such a wonderful, happy person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that... Mm -hmm. That certainly comes through, and it's and it's uh, compelling to to think about the ways that 
you're able to tell that story by telling the broader story. I know I mentioned that a few times, but but those are insights that we're able to see because because you choose to keep the story or to move the story forward in time and not just end. Is the, the other thing I should add, if I might. Um, yeah, yeah, of course. There was a um, a nun in Mindelheim, Germany, named Leontine, who was critically important to Selena. Uh, she tutored her in English and German. Um, for about 18 months before Selena and her family came to the United States. But she also worked with Selena um, to get over her bitterness and hatred toward Germans. And Selena learned forgiveness. Um, key part of her life. She kept in touch with that nun um, until the nun died in 1950. So they wrote back and forth. I think there are 23 of the nun's letters still in existence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think those are, it, it, those are compelling stories. And <clears throat> great to hear them told through a woman like Selena, right? I, I think about some of the more prominent narr narratives of the Holocaust and forgiveness, that kind of thing. Um, and, and her story seems a, a distinct in, in, in that, uh, both similar, I guess I should say, to many narratives, but also her own in a way that isn't the prominent, you know, I'm thinking of some of the more prominent narratives like uh, Night, or, or I think it's Night by, by Weitzel, um, or you know, some of these others that, that are standard reading for students, uh, you know, that this is a slightly different story, but no less important. Yeah. I'm gonna ask uh, one more question and then we've got some questions that are coming in. This is, we're gonna, so we're gonna turn to that Q&A section. Um, we've got, so feel free to drop those in as you have them. But the last question I had for you <clears throat> is just at the, with the benefit of hindsight, you know, the book's been out for you know, about a year now, right? Uh, close to it? Six months. Six months. Okay. Yes. It was because it was last fall. Seven and, months. Yeah. Yeah. I feel, you could tell me, you could tell me that we were in August and I might believe you because it's been such a, <laughs> such a long first part of the year uh, with <laughs> lots of stuff going on for, for us here. But, uh, but looking back uh, after seven months, is there anything that, that you would change? Anything that you would have liked to have included any new insights that have come out uh, since the book is published? Uh, just anything that you're like, oh, wow, I forgot that story. Or, oh, I found this out afterwards. I, maybe, and maybe not, I'm just curious. Like, um, I can't think of anything offhand that I, I would change, but I would have changed the research a little bit. Um, had COVID not been around, I certainly would have spent some time at the Holocaust Museum in their collections. Mm -hmm. um, I would have gone to Poland to see Krakow, to see her house, um, to go right south to Plashoff. Um, I would like to have seen Schindler's factory in Brunlitz, Czechoslovakia, and um, I would have been very interested to see Auschwitz. I mean, mm -hmm. I, for, for me, whenever I write a biography, I try to go where the people had been. Um, it sort of gives you a sense uh, that you might not get otherwise of the person. So um, those are the things I might have done, and that might have changed the narrative. I, I really don't know. Do you, not to, I know I promised the last question from my section, but now I, the chair's privilege, I have a, a follow-up. Uh, <laughs> do, do you think you would, uh, you'd like to, you know, do those things? Like, is that a kind of, is that the kind of thing that is now kind of still on your list? Maybe not the research, but going and seeing those places and spaces, you know, is that still kind of a thing that is on that list for you that you'd be like, yeah, I, I hope I can do that to kind of yeah. close the loop of, I, of this story. I, I think so. I would very much like to see uh, the places that Selena experienced, unfortunately experienced during the Holocaust. So yes, I would like to uh, yeah. travel there sometime. Yeah, yeah. That, that, I, I imagine that was your answer, but I was just curious. Uh, uh, so the first question that came in um, is, there's kind of a comment, but I'm sure you could elaborate a little bit more. And I have a question that would come out of it, but is it says uh, on Iowa's importance, you wrote that Phyllis selected Iowa over New York because she thought it might be a better place for Selena to get acclimated to, reacclimated to society. Right. Um, good. It's more of a, it's a comment, uh, but uh, could you talk a little bit about that then, you know, for maybe for those, especially those who maybe haven't read the sure. book? Sure. I, I think Phyllis um, was thinking about the size, uh, the size of the city. And I think she felt that Selena would just get lost and overwhelmed by the um, hugeness of New York. Um, she knew that uh, Iowa was reputed to have good schools. She had heard that from uh, David Karp, the, uh, the uncle. Um, and she thought the, the city, the much smaller city would be easier to get to know people. So sure. I, 
I think she picked it because of its size. Mm -hmm. That was, I'm not, I'm, I'm an immigration historian of a different era, but I know that those, those things were often, for people who were coming from Europe at the time I was studying was often a, the size <clears throat> and the ability to kind of settle were, were certainly big uh, motivators for decision making. Right. So. right. Great. Um, all right, great. So I've got, we have a few pre-submitted questions that I'll read as well. But if for folks who are here, um, again, please keep using that Q&A feature and we'll jump around to that um, as you ask questions. Um, so I wonder if, I just a little bit more, the question from ahead of time was, uh, has Selena returned to Europe since her encounter uh, to see some of those same spaces? Or if, do you know if she's had a chance to go to those spaces you mentioned um, and, and what that looked like for her? And Yes, um, she, she's been back to Europe a lot of times uh, mm -hmm. since. Um, she, they were traveling with some friends, Selena and her husband, Binny, and uh, another couple. And they went to Mindelheim. So she was uh, showing them where she knew this nun who tutored her in English and German. Wonderful little town where they stayed uh, for about a year before they came to the United States uh, in Bavaria, Germany. Um, I'm sorry, what was the question? I, I just got lost. Oh, it was about her when she's returned to, to oh, right. Europe. You know, like right. But the other place that she, she's been to uh, twice is Auschwitz. And neither time would she go into the camp. She uh, stayed at the front gate, but she didn't go in. She even went back for the 70th anniversary of um, the liberation of Auschwitz. Um, and they had a ceremony there. So the ceremony was in a big tent right outside the front gate. But they, um, there was part of the ceremony which they encouraged the survivors to go into a memorial that was built inside of Auschwitz and Selena couldn't go in. She, so she's not been inside Auschwitz. Um, she's seen Plaschow, there's not much left to see at Plaschow. She's been back to Krakow, seen her old apartment. Um, I don't know if she's been to Brunlitz or not. There's not much to see at the Schindler factory there, I understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. I I have I have been to Auschwitz um, and can see I I, I you know it, it is a it's a yeah I've seen those memorials and it's it's a hard place to visit as someone who did not go through it I right cannot, so imagine yes I cannot even fathom how difficult it would be to return um, <laughs> right and so any anyway, that's a that's an aside uh, this was a question that, that just came in which is you mentioned all the books that you read to prepare. Um, and they were wondering what, if they wanted to read more about the Holocaust, I mean, what were your, what was the most useful for you as you were trying to understand this new kind of field of the Holocaust or Ju Judaism in, in Iowa, that kind of thing? Um, um, I'd recommend two books. And I can't think of the uh, title. Um, David Crow is the author. And David Crow, it's C-R-O-W-E. And he wrote a biography of Schindler which mm -hmm. is the definitive book on Schindler. It really straightens out the, um, the issues, the problems with the movie and the, the uh, book Schindler's List. So it's a great book. I would recommend that highly. Um, the other book I'd recommend is by a historian named David Noble, who looks at how the Holocaust has been viewed since the Holocaust up to the present, changing views of the Holocaust and changing uh, understandings of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Another great book. So this this is one that thank you. Uh, th this is one that was in uh, sent in ahead of time. I think you've already covered it, um, but I'll ask it anyway for the sake of the the person who sent it. Which was what was the hardest part about trying to tackle this project? And so I'm I'm guessing some of this might have to do with COVID, but there's other things too. You know what? Maybe expand on the on the challenging parts of it. Um, were there any? I wonder. <laughs> And I'll add to this to maybe add another wrinkle as to fill out the answer would be, you know, were you ever having to deal with things that were not in English? I don't know what your own language background oh. is, but, you know, what did that look like to try to. So that's sure. a big I've expanded the question substantially from what was the hardest part of this project. So you pursue that right. any way you want, and I might needle you a little bit more to try to to get sure. some more answers. Um, there were some topics that I would raise with Selena where even if I wasn't seeing her, even if it wasn't a Zoom, if it was a phone call, even I could tell by her voice cracking that it was an uncomfortable topic. 
And sometimes I backed away from those and then we'll come back to them later. And sometimes I just push through, but um, it always struck me as a very delicate situation, a balancing act. Um, <clears throat> There was one document that I really needed to see. It was only in German. Um, it was a memoir of Julius Madrich. Madrich, I should say, um, was like Schindler. A, a, he was a Viennese German, but he was a, a Viennese man who was in Krakow. He took over a confiscated Jewish factory, but it's Madrich who really, um, he took over the factory that, where the Karps worked, where Slim's parents worked. And uh, he took very, very good care of the, the Jewish workers. Um, so I needed to see that uh, document. It's about 28 pages. And uh, I worked with Sandy Yoder and we found someone to translate it for me because I do not speak German. Mm -hmm. I wish I did, but I don't. <laughs> That's always the challenge I, I find, you know, working in Europe is there some languages you can get through depending on your back, what you've studied in the past, but sometimes right. you wander into, it's like me when I see something in French, I just, I don't have a chance uh, <laughs> I, I need to find some help. Um, <laughs> terrific, yeah, that, 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 makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, a question that, that also came in is wondering about Selena's uh, papers, records, that kind of thing, you know, so, so you did, you, were, are there, or did you do oral histories? Are these things, you know, where are, where are, how, how would someone find out more about her or, or, or continue to pursue a project like this? And I'm not sure uh, if they're headed at her own house. Right, well, Selena, um, she doesn't have any papers really from the Holocaust because yeah. everything was taken away. Mm -hmm. um, there were some photographs I got to use in the book that were from that right before the Holocaust. Um, there's a picture of her father walking into camp. I got that from the Holocaust Museum. But the Carps had given some of their keepsakes to a, a Gentile friend before they uh, were sent to the ghetto. So they recovered those after the war. But as to papers, she doesn't really have papers per se. Right. Um, she, she has records of when she was teaching. She has things like that, but um, nothing really going back to the European period. Mm -hmm. I imagine, and maybe, you know, I, I realize this is beyond her experience, but I imagine that's quite common for if, you, if you're trying to study or research an individual who has gone through, you know, the Holocaust or something like that, like that you're not, you, they may have papers or records from po the post period, but I imagine there's very little um, right. that you'd find by way of papers. Is that, is that correct? I, I'm not, I, 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 I think that's true. Yeah. And I, I would say to, um, pe if people are interested, if you Google Selena Binias, you can find uh, videotapes of her giving presentations, certainly at the Iowa Jewish Historical Society's website. Mm -hmm. um, and the Shoah Foundation interview that she gave in 1996, I think her mother is on that tape too, was one of the first times Selena talked about her experience. And you can access that through the Shoah Foundation. Okay. And, and that that's a part of a larger project, is that right? You know, or the with the Shoah yeah, Foundation. The Shoah Foundation was an organization that uh, Steven Spielberg set up to um, do as many oral histories of Holocaust survivors as he could. It's now tied to USC. And I think they have 55,000 um, oral histories of Holocaust survivors. Mm -hmm. Is there anything at the Iowa Jewish Historical Society that, that also could, um, that folks could look into? Um, yeah, they have oral histories. Um, some are transcribed, some are not, but uh, I would certainly recommend people go to the Iowa Jewish Historical Society. You can make a, um, a reservation and go see the museum, interesting mm -hmm. museum. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a question that, that's come in since then, or, or tonight, which is about, uh, you mentioned that for a long time that Selena chose not to tell her story or, or kept it hidden. Right. Why did she decide <laughs> to tell her story when she did? Um, when Thomas Keneally's book, Schindler's List, comes out, Selena saw the book review in the uh, New York Times Sunday book review, and she couldn't get over it. She read the review and she said, this is my life in print. Who'd want to read this? Um, so she ran out and read the book and she recognized everything. She thought it was her story. She had a, a similar reaction when the movie came out, oh, but more visceral because it was visual and it was in front of her. And she she broke down in the Auschwitz scene when the train pulls up to, uh, to Auschwitz. The book, but more so the movie, really convinced Selena that 
people had the necessary context now that they could understand or have a better possibility of understanding what she went through. So she gradually started talking about it, giving interviews and then talking about it publicly after 1993. Mm -hmm. That's interesting to think about um, the importance of, you know, I, I, I asked a question earlier about the public awareness and popular culture, but how, oh, a movie, you know, essentially opened the door for people to begin telling their stories again because they felt like people were listening. You know, Selena's parents talked about uh, the Holo their Holocaust experience about 10 or 12 years before Selena did. Mm -hmm. um, and they were moved to do that through, there was a nine part um, Holocaust program miniseries on television in 78 or 79. Uh, Sophie's Choice was a dramatization of a Holocaust story. Um, so that convinced her parents to start talking in the early 80s about mm -hmm. it. But the interesting uh, thing to me is Selena and her parents did not talk about the Holocaust. Uh, her parents realized that Selena was very private about it and they didn't raise the issue with her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, yeah. I'm sure that there are folks who uh, specialize in, you know, who, who are counselors or psychologists who maybe understand the mechanisms that go into keeping those things inside. Mm -hmm. um, I am not qualified to, to, to illuminate there. I, if you are, you feel free to talk about it, but I think you're also a historian like me. So uh, that I am. Yeah. So, so this is the wrong book club. If you're looking for uh, <laughs> insights into the, to the human mind or, or psyche. Um, so we've got, I'm going to read this here because we mentioned the Jewish, the Iowa Jewish Historical Society, but uh, this one is another, the Iowa Jewish Historical Society has a website, which is ijhs.online. Um, you should be able to, some might see this on, on the answers. Um, and it says the museum has the Schindler Cup that the Karp family used while prisoners in Czechoslovakia and a pair right. of soldiers that right. the Schindlers gave to the that the, that the Schindlers gave the family to use for barter to rebuild their lives after the war ended. Um, right. So that was uh, just for the for the good of the group. That was a comment that just came in um, as well. So wanted to share that since we were asking about those kinds of things. So uh, on I, those scissors, I have a, a funny story about those scissors. Um, Selena would carry these scissors around with her when she flew around to uh, give presentations, and she was in LAX with her daughter um, and she had the scissors in her carry-on and the TSA looked at the bag and they said, you can't take these. And they were gonna take the scissors and throw them away. And Selena's daughter said, oh, no, no, no. That's a historic relic from the Holocaust. You can't do that. So the TSA allowed her to take them to Iowa here to make a presentation. But um, at that point, Sandy Yoder, the head of the IJHS said, we've got to figure something out because you can't take these scissors back on the plane again. Yeah. So uh, Sandy worked it out and she got a private plane. Uh, Mid-American Energy had a private plane that flew the scissors to Southern California and hand delivered them back to Selena. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, I, that's, that's fascinating. And, and to think about something as, not as simple, but you know, scissors, you know, having this meaning, but then also running into something as every day as TSA and having to figure out <laughs> how, to, how to navigate a historic item with uh, an organ uh, someone who probably is not looking for historic artifacts uh, or items uh, in their day to day. Um, There's another question that's come in, which is, <laughs> will Selena return to um, Iowa anytime soon? Um, we don't know. There's a possibility she might be out in the fall. It just depends on uh, a number of factors, but mm -hmm. we hope so. And then and another one wants to know if you know the story uh, or the significance of the speaker uh, of the scissors says it's a good story if you if you know it. I, I'm sorry. Oh, it said to ask if you know this can explain or know the significance of the scissors themselves. Um, wondered if you if you know could, could give the background of those scissors. Um, I, I'm not sure what the person's asking. Um, or the, the scissors from the plane, the ones that she brought with her, um, do you know their, their story? I think- Well, it, they were, um, yeah. the, the pair of scissors were um, some of the items that were given to the carps to barter. 
Uh, mm -hmm. I think they were given five pairs of scissors and this was the one pair that uh, Selena's mother kept and they, they kept these scissors. Okay. Um, I thought the other issue was that the person was mentioning, um, Rob Binney as Selena's son remembered seeing those scissors. And after he read the book, Schindler's List, a light bulb went off on his head and he said, those scissors, I wonder, I wonder if they came from um, the Holocaust and from Schindler's factory. And she, he called his mother and he said, those scissors, they're, they're funny scissors with the blunt nose. Were you in the Holocaust and, and are these from Schindler's factory? And she said, yes. Mm -hmm. But that was one of the first inklings that Rob had um, of his mother's past. Mm, interesting. I, I didn't, I, I hadn't heard that part of the, the story. It, it sounds too like some of these things are being put, you know, like for her and for the people around her, it, it's been slowly piecing together you know, what it looks like to carry that story and tell that story, right? As people are being let into, into that part of her life. Is that, mm -hmm. is that fair? Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, um, I think it is. I think it is. Yeah. Terrific. Um, let me see, we've got a couple questions here. I want to make sure I haven't missed anything. I apologize. I've been jumping around because I've been, we've been moving thematically a little bit uh, as, as we're, people are talking. So if people do have questions, we still have about you know, 10 minutes or more. So if you have questions or comments, feel free to drop those into the chat. We have time to, to get to those. I wonder if you could, you know, you mentioned, sorry, this is my question because I, I got to orient myself here a second, but you mentioned some of the other stories that haven't been told here in Iowa. Could you talk a little bit about what the next step of maybe this project would be? Maybe it's not telling Selena's story, another another story, but let's say someone has read your book, they're at the book club, they're really excited about this work. What would you say to them, here's the story that needs to be told, or here is where you could pick this up and take it to, you know, to turn the next page, if you will. Does that does that make some sense? You know, what what would be the next step after this biography? Not necessarily for you, if you wanted to be for you, maybe, but but for the person who wants to keep digging here. Right. Um, I would point that person to the Iowa Jewish Historical Society. And I would say you should talk to uh, either Sandy Yoder or uh, Sarah Carlson out there. Um, I'm sure they have many ideas about uh, possible Iowa stories. Mm -hmm. And you said there are at least two that you could think of Holocaust survivors? Yeah. Um, I don't know if the people are interested in books. I, I don't know anything about it, but um, there's David Wallerman, who is in Des Moines. Um, and there's uh, Harold Kasimov in Grinnell, a retired uh, Grinnell professor. Um, both have very interesting Holocaust stories mm. and might be, uh, I mean, there may be a couple of others, but uh, there are not very many Holocaust survivors left in Iowa. So that might be the last two. Mm. So this is another question that's come in. And this person asks, you mentioned trying, to, you mentioned deciding when to push or not push Selena on particular topics. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the human element of trying to do this historical project, understanding when to put, as so I think what they're asking is how you as a, as a person who is also a historian working on a project are trying to judge when to push a little harder to get that important information and when maybe to let it go. Does that, I think, that, I think that's the question. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Um, boy, it, it just depends on the tenor of the conversation at the time. Um, and it would be much easier if I could see the person I'm talking to, if I could see Selena. Um, because the times I Zoomed with her, I don't think we were dealing with any really difficult subjects. So mm -hmm. I think they're mostly phone calls. And it was just a sense, I could have been wrong, but it was just a sense that her voice started to crack. And I thought, well, you know, let's come back to that. Or maybe I can... Uh, find out more about that another way. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's about all I can tell you. Is, I wonder, you know, it sounds to me too, like this wasn't just a one-off sit down interview with Selena. You had these, uh, I imagine there was a relationship that was built, right? D d does that also kind of ring true? That, oh, absolutely. That um, it it took a while to do that, but I interviewed Selena, I'm guessing 10 or 15 times, 15 or 20 times. We talked a lot. Um, she was very adept at emailing, so we emailed a lot. She would send me a lot of uh, information on uh, 
on every subject uh, we were talking about. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, we developed a rapport and it just grew over the uh, almost three years it took to do the project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I imagine that you, as, a, as you got to know her, understood where those boundaries were, you know, like you so. that, built that trust and respect, so yeah. yeah. It's an, it's, an, it's an interesting question to think about because as a, I don't know about you, but in my historical training, we didn't learn a lot about, you know, the, it's not quite eth ethnography, but even oral histories, you know, like we learn a little bit, but, you know, a lot more of archival methods and digging through papers right. and, and that kind of thing. It's a, it's a, not the historian's first tool in our toolbox. So, uh, all the time. yeah. So another question that came in, uh, asked, could you talk about the meeting with Gail Gatto? I probably said that name wrong. I don't know. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Uh, yeah, it says, could you talk about the meeting with Gail, G-A-I-L-G-A-D-O? Oh, Gal Gadot. Yeah, oh, Gal Gadot, sure. Yeah, sorry. I, yeah. Um, well, I wasn't there. Um, Selena was invited to um, Gal's house for a Holocaust Remembrance Day. Um, and Selena, regaled them with with stories people loved uh, meeting her and hearing uh, her I think there were about 50 people at gal's house um harvey keitel was there uh sasha barra cohen was there um so a lot of uh la stars came out to see uh see selena mm. interesting i i that's Thank you for help. I glad I spelled it out. I, oh, no, that's okay. And actually, somebody said it was Wonder Woman meeting Wonder Woman. Yeah, which I thought was good. <laughs> yeah. Um, so one of the, this is another question that had that had come in ahead of time, which is about uh, kind of reconciliation, forgiveness. You mentioned a little bit about the nun uh, earlier tonight, so I know we touched on that theme. But could you talk a little bit about what what that looked like? I, I know that's a big in my experience, I know that, or my my reading that, you know, reconciliation, forgiveness, you know, how victims of the Holocaust are, are navigating those spaces with Germans in Germany um, and the perpetrators of, of genocide, you know, what that, what that process has looked like. And could you talk a little bit about what reconciliation, forgiveness, or, or experience with Germans and perpetrators did or didn't look like for her? Um. While she was just getting to know um, Matter Leontine, the nun, um, Selena had a, I think it was a math tutor and he was a former Nazi. And Selena um, decided very, very early on that um, she was going to do her absolute best to prove to this guy that a young Jewish girl, 13 year old, um, could do all this complicated math um, and remember, Selena had only had an education through uh, second grade. Her education ended there when the Germans invaded uh, Krakow, came into Krakow in 1939. So um, she used it as motivation to, to prove uh, Germans wrong. But then as she um, started working with Matter Leontine, she, she realized that, as in Selena's words, not all Germans were ogres. It was individuals, not the whole uh, German people. And that's about all I can tell you about uh, yeah. Selena. So, and that's one of the key um, elements she brings up every time she talks about it, that you really need to forgive people and move on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that, I, that make, based on, you know, reading the book and think that makes sense. I just, it's a good, and then the, the last step, it, and I asked that question, and there's another question that came in that I think maybe is the next, um, you know, another element of that, or at least thematically connected, which is how can Selena's story and others like hers help us reduce anti-Semitism in the U.S. Uh, today? Well, I, I think it just, uh, Selena bears witness to what happened, what uh, horrible things can happen if we're not vigilant. Um, I think that's the, the takeaway from this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and telling that story, I imagine, helps to you know, telling the story is an important part of that, you know, I imagine. Oh, absolutely. You know. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Terrific. Well, we are, we've gotten through, I think, most of the questions. We have time if somebody, if anybody wanted to slip, wants to slip one in, but I've reserved, I like to reserve the last five minutes or so just to ask you, you know, like, what are your first, you know, the first part of the question is what are your big takeaways 
from this project? Based on our conversation today, I think I know the answers, but I think it's a nice way to kind of tie up an, an evening of conversation is what, what do you take away as the person who's done this work from, from the story, from the project? You know what, um, every time I talk to Selena, what always strikes me is Selena's incredible bravery at the time. And she doesn't consider herself a brave person, but she's a, a perfect example of an ordinary little girl at the time who was dealing with extraordinarily awful circumstances and she got through it. And the same with her parents. Her mother was a huge influence on Selena. Her mother always told her, the world owes you nothing. You know, you gotta make your way. Um, so every time I would talk to Selena, I really was in awe. And I know historians are supposed to take a step back and. And, and try not to do that. But Selena is really an incredible woman with mm -hmm. an incredible story. And part of her story is really what she built after the war. I think it's a really critical element of her story. Mm -hmm. it's, it strikes me just now when you say, you know, little girl, that, that she was a little girl. You know, she wasn't, you know, we think about, you know, maybe in our mind's eye, we think of her as at least a young adult or, or something along those lines, right? Like that maybe is the image that comes to mind, but right. reminding ourselves that she was indeed a little, you know, a girl, maybe a little girl, but about, but certainly a, a child uh, or a young. Well, she was eight years old when the Germans yeah. invaded. Yeah. She exactly. wanted to go to third grade and she couldn't. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. You know, that this is, this is a child's experience, which is absolutely important, important in, in how we tell the story. Um, so well, and it's also important because um, her memories are as a child, right? So her parents' memories are different because um, they were adults at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so it was interesting to, to listen to uh, interview tapes of her parents who remembered and emphasized different things, for instance, than, than Selena does. Yeah. Yeah. And right. it's still striking to me, the parent and Selena really never talked about this. Mm -hmm. um, and Selena... Um, as far as I know, she had never heard those interview tapes of her parents talking oh, about really? the Holocaust. Yeah. Mm. Has she has she now or, or she hadn't at the time? She hadn't. The, the last time we were talking about it, she hadn't. So I don't know if she's listened to them now or not. Yeah. don't know the answer. Interesting. And it might be a thing that is that they never felt the need to to discuss, right. you know, in life. And, and so to re respect. I, Anyway, uh, we could talk. I could talk about this. I'm fascinated by by the work you've done and what and how you've done it and and how the story is told. But our time is running out, and I always like to ask the last question. The, one of my last questions, or the last question, which is, uh, you know, do you, what are you working on now, or what other do you have other projects in the hopper? What what are you know? Uh, this book is out. I know most historians finish one book and will move on to another project in in a variety of forms. Do you? What are you working on these days? Um, I've been in conversations with a retired uh, University of Iowa professor named David Schoenbaum. Mm -hmm. um, and we're thinking of doing a book on immigration and we would use uh, the Southeast Asian immigrants coming to Iowa as a case study. Mm -hmm. um, so we wanna look at their experience after they arrived in Iowa to see what, where they end up. So mm -hmm. if we're talking about it, we might do that. Yeah, and that would be the, in the 1970s, 80s, that, that that wave, right? Yes. Yeah. Fascinating. I, I, there's, there's a lot there as well that could be researched and written about. There's not absolutely. Um, there's, yeah. Uh, that if I can plug, I, you know, a big encouragement or a plug <laughs> that like that's certainly a topic that we have not studied as much as we should. Um, there's a lot of richness there. So a special edition of the Annals of Iowa. We could do it. I, there I, you go. You've, got, you've got the right crowd. I'm. I'm <laughs> I am, I, I just, just pitch me, just pitch me. You know, like that, that's what I would say. Oh, wonderful. Well, I just, I think with that answer, we are right at about our time. So this is all the time we have tonight. I think everyone can, we can agree this has been really informative and meaningful. And I just want to thank you, uh, Bill, for joining us this evening and making time. It, it's been really rich and I appreciate the work and I want to thank everyone who's joined us tonight um, a great crowd um, I, I just love the chance to get to chat with people whose work I admire who I get to work with um, and we're honored to have you and have all of you joining us tonight so thank you for that um, I do hope everyone will sign up for our next book club um, which will be after summer so in September um, I already kind of 
plugged that, it'll be Annette Dumlap's biography of Lou Henry Hoover, A Woman of Adventure, a uh, very different life, uh, but also kind of the story of an Iowa girl who has gone on and, and lives a, a pretty robust life. So if you want more information or look at register registering for future webinars, you can find all that on our website where you found this. Um, as well, you can check out some of our other digital programs, Goldie's Kids Club, for young historians, watch um, our Iowa History 101 series, um, which is held uh, here in Des Moines, um, or you could subscribe to the Annals, which has brand new cutting edge research on Iowa history, including a brand new issue on the farm crisis. So yeah, we were even working in, in, the, in the 20th century, Bill. I, I was, I, we were in the trenches in the 20th century. <laughs> It was a good time. It was a good time. Um, but thank you all, everyone, for joining us today. It's been a great evening. And thank you to Bill. Everyone, just thank you so much and have a great night. Thank you very much.